Father, we come before you so thankful that you allowed us to see another morning and gather here at the church house. Lord, I pray even now we're so grateful for who you are, your mercy, your love, your strength, the God of all comfort, not only for ourselves, but for those we love. We feel so inadequate, so powerless to, to help those we love, but we know that when we pray to God and we move the hand of God, the Spirit of God can do all things, comfort, provide, protect, all these things. And now, what a glorious blessing for you to reveal your word to us. And but now, before we open your word and study, we do want to pray for David uh, and the difficulty that he is facing. And help him, Lord, to be a man of courage. And we learn that a man of courage will, will do what's right in the eyes of God, even if it, even if it costs him something. So we pray you help him to discern and to know what to do and to have that great courage knowing that you are his provider and protector, and that to be right with God is more important than anything. So help him through that difficulty and bring consensus and agreement, uh, and yet not compromise to the word of God. We also want to pray for the Wilson family over in Kenya. Lord, we're aware, as we watch the news, uh, lives are, are very much in danger as, uh, as Muslims and other terrorist groups, other religious beliefs, Again, I pray for a hedge of protection about them. Help them to uh, be able to focus on you and be focusing on the mission that you have for them and, and, and to walk in faith, even amidst the danger, even amidst the storm, like Peter. Help them to keep their eyes focused on you, uh, their God, their protector, their Savior. We also want to pray for Cassidy, that little one. We're so grateful that you're the God that said, suffer little children to come unto me. Give her peace and help her even at that age to understand that she's doing what God's asking her to do. And let this be a pattern for the rest of her life. And as she learns what you have to say, help her to believe it. Believe the words of God and then bless that obedient family. And then lastly, we pray for Michelle's mother, uh, uh, Donna, and the need for getting uh, that change in the oil and all those things. There's money involved, but we know that you can do provide. And we thank you that you provide for us. And now we're alongside of her and help things to work out in such a way that they're so thankful that they praise you for the God that you are. And Larry, with the surgery coming, we pray you help that surgeon to be influenced and controlled and led by the Spirit that it would be the most skillful surgery the man has ever performed because of your influence. And comfort Larry and Florence and the family. Surgery is always a time when we draw this close to you. So help that to go well. And now again, I pray to study today Learn the word of God. Help that to go well in your eyes, that we would uh, leave here uh, better and more aware and more willing to, to follow Jesus. I pray this by faith now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for letting me go a little longer there. All right. Page 52 in our guidebook. Again, we're in Unit 2. And unit 1 was God revealed. Now Unit 2 is more about the power. The power. Last week it was the, the power of, of, uh, of, of living water, if you remember. Remember the story of Jesus with the lady by the well? She, he talked about if you, you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. Yeah, go ahead. But, but he said, but if you drink of the water that I'm going to give you, remember? That you'll never thirst. And that water, that living water, right? That's a reference to what? The Holy Spirit. And so how many of you understand? You should understand if you're a Christian, if you're saved, you should understand that when you got saved, that God himself, that person of the Holy Spirit, came inside of you. And many times the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as, as living water. And so hence the idea when Jesus said living water, like a well springing out of you. And, and that's a, a neat symbolic picture. It's very true. But, but it's very applicable when you think that, uh, especially last week, God's talking about us going to, to tell others about Jesus. And we are all aware that God commands us to do that. But may, maybe what we need to be reminded of is whatever God commands you and I to do, he gives us the power to do it. And it's through the Holy Spirit that's in you. The power to forgive or the power to, to obey whatever God tells you to do. And so if you're a little bit nervous, you got tummy, tummy ache, you're a little bit nervous about passing out a track or approaching a friend or someone at work or some family member, it, you, you can try to prepare the best you can, but then you approach them in faith. And, and God promised the Holy Spirit of God's going to help you and give you the words to speak. That happens with me all the time where things just come out. 
and scripture comes to my remembrance, and the Spirit of God helps me make that presentation. I'm a little bit nervous. If, if you ball players, you know the butterflies you get before you play ball, but then once, you, once after the kickoff, once the first couple pitches, and then you're just, you're just engaged in the game. It's kind of like that with, with witnessing. You might be a little bit nervous initially, but once you in, get engaged in the conversation, the Spirit of God moves in you, and it just seems to flow out of you. And, it, and, and if you can recall what you said, oh, that, that sounded beautiful. Yeah, that's because that was God using you, speaking uh, through you, and saying loving scriptural <coughs> truths, you know. So that was last week, but we're going to continue in a sense because the title of this lesson today is The Power to Save. And we're going to pick it up right where we left off, John chapter 4. Remember, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. The whole idea, where was that well? That was in Samaria, remember? And, and so the Jews in Judea, Judea, south, and then Galilee up north by the, that lake, the Sea of Galilee, and everybody went around. No, no, Jesus must needs go right through Samaria to this group of people that needed to hear the gospel. He was aware of how the Jews look at the Samaritans and how the Samaritans look at them and all that kind of stuff. God, God could care less. They, they needed to hear the gospel. So he went through that. And that message to you and I is that we should go and see people that need to hear the gospel. And it doesn't matter their size, shape, form, religious background, color of the skin, all that kind of stuff. We're going to go see them because God died for them as much as he did you and I. Now today, we're looking at, we're going to finish up uh, chapter 4, and it's the power to save. And, and, and the author asked that question. If you can't read it, I'm going to read it to you. How can believers give guidance to people who are open to faith in Jesus? We're going to tell them what, that we believe, and then we're going to challenge them possibly, but then we're always thinking of guiding them to faith in Jesus. Now we're going to develop that. Okay, we're going to develop that. But, but the first idea was we're going to tell them we're going to tell them that we believe. And, and there's a word for that. It's called your testimony. Now you're in Sunday school. You can learn these terms and everything. And, it, and, and uh, testifying, think of a legal scenario. You're in the courtroom, and you, you get called up. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. All right, you have a seat there, and I'll shut up. <laughs> and so then, then they ask you questions, right? And then, and then you answer, and you are testifying as to what happened or what you saw, right? And so, biblically, when, when you, 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 you're going to give your testimony, you're going to give your personal testimony, you're going to tell others what God did. That's, it's personal. It's yours. Why do I say that? Because it can't be wrong. You can care less what anybody has. To, they don't believe it. Ah, this is what happened. So you never have to be afraid to give your personal testimony. It's yours. And God would like us to use our personal testimony from time to time. Because God will use it to lead others to faith in Jesus. So let, let's get into the scripture right away. So the power to save. And, and, and here, here's what he, we're going to be talking about today. How can I best influence people to believe Jesus for salvation? And notice I emphasize to, to believe Jesus, they've heard of Jesus. Well, I believe in Jesus. But what they mean is they believe he exists. But they haven't put their faith in him. They haven't believed in Jesus for salvation. That's what we're talking about. So let's take a look under the, uh, page 54 now. The first thing, to, to quite simply, just grab a hold of what you're going to learn today with God's help. Number one, you're going to tell them you believe. That's what it says. Tell them you believe. Tell them what happened. Tell them why you believe. What happened in your life. Let's read. Here's an example. So, so we're picking up with the woman at the well. Remember the lady? Remember she came to the well by herself? Remember she probably was a, somewhat of an outcast herself? How, why did you figure that? Because ladies do everything together. Okay? You know, when, when, you, when you, at the prom, they all went into the restroom together. At, even when you get a bunch of did the ladies go to the rest. I got to go to the powder room. I'll go with you. You know, so ladies go together. It's safer, okay? And they do. Hey, I'm going to go to the mall, okay? Well, you, you know, you go, you go with other people. You go with your sisters. You go, you know, you can, you can go to the restroom by yourself. You can go to the mall by yourself. But it's very common, you know, to go with other people. That's right. And so when you're going to the well, that was a social gathering place. There could be all manner of people there. You know, there could be, you know, Harley Davidson bikers. There could be, you know, some bad. So you you go with your sisters. You go with family. You go. The fact that she went by herself probably and that she had four or five different husbands and all that kind of stuff, she probably was looked upon okay, in a way that we understand. didn't matter to Jesus. And all that mattered was that he needed to share the truth of the gospel. 
just so needed to hear about Jesus. Thank you very much, Lord. Okay, and then, then he did. And he presented the idea that he is living water, salvation. You receive the Holy Spirit, it becomes living water. Gotcha. Now let's, let's, let's read. It says in verse 39, uh, John chapter 4, verse 39 to 42. If you're following in your Bible, the Bible says, so, so, so then she gets saved. She believes in Jesus, okay? So, so then she has to go tell somebody. It says in verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, see that word? <clears throat> which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. <clears throat> and many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. All right, so take, let's take a look at some things right off the bat. And I'm just pulling this out of the material just in case you didn't read it. But the first thing to grab a hold of, and I kind of alluded to it already, right? This, was this, this lady have a business? Was she some politician? Was she some somebody in the community that, hey, everybody's going to, like, like e, Mrs. E.F. Hutton? She's going to speak? No, no, no. She was an ordinary person. And here's the point. I have it in the bonus material sheet if you have one. Ordinary individuals can exert extraordinary influence when they're willing to tell others about what Jesus has done in their lives. Ordinary individuals, that's like you and me. So you could just say we can exert extraordinary influence. Oh, yeah, 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 you can. Yes, you can. Second item I have there, a testimony uh, of faith need not be sensational to be genuine and effective. Okay, some of you, I've heard this, I never thought this until someone brought it up in the class, that the idea that, you know, your testimony has to be sensational. I never thought that, but, but it, maybe you have. Maybe you hear other testimonies about how they were hanging from a cliff, and while he was hanging there on the rope, he was there for four days, and then the Lord came to him, and you know, then he got saved, and miraculously, the helicopter, you know, and some sensational story, good for you. I personally, I don't care as long as you got saved. Glory to God you got saved, okay? But don't think that yours is not as good as somebody else's. Who could, I could care less. The miracle is in the, the salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Thank you. How many of you are awake this morning? Say amen. All right. Amen. Yeah, I said say amen. Raise my hand. Okay, okay. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 but, but do you see that? Yours doesn't have to be sensational the way some people would define it. It is sensational. You're going to heaven now. That is sensational. You're saved. It doesn't matter how you got saved. So, so I threw that in there because the author mentioned that as well. And, and then lastly, I have, I might as, well, might as well get them all out before I look at the scripture again. Our testimony's power is not in what we can do, but about what Christ has done in us. So remember your testimony? You're going to testify to others. Where are you trying to direct them? To God. So, so they kind of go together. If you're a storyteller and you kind of like... Uh, you know, like to, uh, what's the word when you make it bigger than what it is? Embellish. 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 Thank you, ladies. So, we don't know anything about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 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 you know, our human nature, we may want to embellish it and make it a little greater than it is, but, but our focus is then on ourselves and embellishing what happens. But, but the idea, your mission for having it and developing it and using it is to direct people to God and the saving power of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. It's not about... You know, promoting myself or, or telling some sensational story. Save that for what the ski trip and the other stuff that you do. That is sensational. But but the purpose of a personal testimony is to, to try to guide people into considering and listening and discovering who Jesus is. That's what it is. It's a personal testimony. It doesn't have to be sensational. The focus is on the power of God and not so much ourselves. Okay. Let, let's read then. Uh, so, 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 so here, we, here we got an example. We have a biblical example of this very thing. This was a common, ordinary lady, and then God touched her life, uh, opened up her understanding. She got gloriously saved. Notice she didn't go home and start watching Gunsmoke for three weeks. Okay, she, she had to tell others. We understand that. If God is is now the Spirit of God's inside of you, 
you know, it's the most miraculous, sensational thing that can ever happen. And so she had to tell others. And so this ordinary lady had had a big impact. How do you know that? Because the Bible says, and many. Now, I don't know how big the town was. It doesn't mean they all got saved, but the Bible says many. So don't get discouraged. Okay, I've only influenced maybe less than 100. Hey, 100 is many. Okay. Uh, oh, it's not 10,000. It's not uh, Billy Graham or somebody else. You know, many, many within your circle of influence. Okay. And so, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. That, you see the, the benefit of a testimony to testify what Jesus has done in your life? It led to people getting saved merely on her testimony. They believed on Jesus. Glory to God. Okay. Uh, verse 40. Here's another thing. I mean, here's what the author brought out. You're going to generally have three responses. I mean, glory to God if somebody gets saved as a result of your testimony. Okay. But, but I, it should not be any shock to anybody that, number two, people may reject. And, and it might look like they're rejecting you. But like, like many of you are nodding your heads are red. You know they're not just they're not they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord, and they're reje they're, they're rejecting who you're testifying about. So, so some will be influenced in a way that it leads to their salvation. Glory to God. Some will reject it. Okay, and then some will will need more information. It's only been visit number one. Okay, and what's the average seven? Okay, so they'll need more more information. They're curious, but they haven't made a commitment. But they're on that road, and, and many of you have lived this out, or you know people where this has literally happened. Some some of you sitting here this morning, someone had an influence in your life, and you had to find out more information. So they invited you to church. They invited you to a Bible study. They got you a trap. They got you more information. They answered some more of your questions, and the Spirit of God worked in you over some period of time, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And then you, you got to that point where you made that life-changing decision. And you surrendered your will. And you responded like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You responded from that Holy Spirit conviction with, with repentance. And you got saved. Okay. So th those are generally three responses. We're in Sunday school. We're talking about what can happen so that you're equipped and prepared. <clears throat> if it happens, praise the Lord. We pray for them. If you don't give up on them, I think somebody said last week. <coughs> yeah, you don't. You continue to pray for them. You just introduce them. So, so, so you, we see there. So some did get saved as a result of her test, testifying and so on. But then others were influenced. Where they had to go see for themselves. Well, I'll come to the church. Well, I'll come to that Bible study. Well, I'll check out the South Campus. I want to come and see for myself. You've planted the seed. They're coming. to Find out more about this Jesus. That's what verse 40 was. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, why did they come? Because of the woman. Because of the influence. You got it. Uh, and they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode. How long did Jesus abode there? Two days. Now here's, here's, it's in the material. Here's a key principle of effective evangelism. A key principle of effective evangelism. The idea that Jesus was living with these lost folks, and yet did not compromise his own integrity. So let's talk about that for a second. We should be aware of that. I remember Curly and Mark, for example. Mark's a new Christian. Uh, his buddies went to a ball game, Nebraska, UCLA, and he did not want, he's younger, you know, and he's sensitive. I, I don't want to drink. I don't want to sin. I don't want to use cuss words. I don't want to, I don't like that profanity. I don't like that anymore. The Holy Spirit of God just convicting you, working in you. You, you don't want to compromise, you know, your, your, your Christian testimony or integrity now. And, but, but you're around uh, lost people, and that's what they do it's because they're lost. They use dirty jokes, profanity, they drink and cuss and all the things that we all did, all the things that lost people do. And so you have to be aware, like Jesus was, that for the most part, they're doing what they're doing because they're lost. And you're okay to be there with them. But that doesn't mean you have to be a partaker of their sin. Yeah, give me a beer, you know. Oh, I'm just, I'm a Christian now. I'm holding back for like a six pack, okay? No, 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 don't, you know, or, or you don't, you don't, hey, I got a dirty one, you don't, don't tell, you don't, you don't want to violate that holiness that God's called you to, and, and so do you kind of understand, you have to navigate through that, and, and I, and so, so you're going to go there out of love for God, out of love for them, or maybe you love a ball game, nothing wrong with going to a ball game, but you understand who you're with, you're understanding the crowd that you're with, and so you kind of, you're kind of guarding your heart that you're not going to partake. So here's what I would suggest uh, in my own life. Prepare. Realize what you're walking into and prepare. 
And how? Oh, maybe you're just going to prepare to say in some way, you know, hey, God, you know, just to let you know, I, I, don't, I don't drink anymore. Now, even as you're preparing for that, you're realizing that if you tell them that you're not drinking anymore, they are lost. You might be implying that, listen, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to stop drinking. I don't think I want to put that obstacle before them. Thank you. Thank you for the hmm. Okay. So, so you might want to you might want to get a little creative and say, hey, tell you what, guys, I'm the designated driver today. So, so I'm passing today. See, see how I, I didn't drink, but I said something in a way because I plan to give them the gospel, and I don't want to create obstacles in their way. You see, so so prepare things like that. What are you going to say? Okay. Another way to prepare is this, Joy. Uh, you can generally say, you know what? I prefer to have them on my turf. Is the way I say. It. Okay, and what do I mean? I'm one saved Christian, especially if I'm young, younger in the faith. By younger, I mean you've been saved less than 10 years. <laughs> Made that up. Okay, so, so, but, but I'm, I'm, one, I'm one Christian, but I'm going to be uh, with 12 lost buddies. And, and the influence, you know, 12 against one. Okay, now you pray, pray up. You can do that. You can do that. Pray up, pray up, pray up. Kind of guard your heart and say, and, and if you bring a six-pack of uh, Mountain Dew, you know, you'll get just you'll you'll get just as excited as they do, yeah. and you won't be sick tomorrow. Okay. Anyway, I'm just you know prepare whatever that means. Okay. But be prepared, or you can say, you know what? I prefer to have them on my turf. What does that look like? Church events, Bible study on Tuesday. You, you got a pastoral staff there. You got a church picnic here. You now 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 they are on my turf, and we kind of outnumber them. And, and then other people could be, hey, I didn't want to introduce you to Jed. You know, Jed to say something great. You know, Chad and Chad would come up. You know, we do that with Glory bringing her, the, the young man of her life, remember? And we got him on our turf. And then everybody just loving on him and so on. So, so some things to consider. But the key principle is God expects us to live among them, but not be a partaker of their sin. Okay, so let's move on. Questions about that? Brian. Oh, man, I can go on. In fact, uh, and I, no, no, no. I, I'll just say if it was me, I would go ahead and do this. Uh, and just kind of get back to what we're talking about. If you were in that situation or anybody here uh, that you quit drinking, and then these other people that you know are trying to save their children, they say, hey, uh, Brian, or, hey, Rick, want to hand me that beer? What would you do? I would do. Mm -hmm. I would have it. Because it's oh, free that's will. An yeah, yeah. yeah. It's free will. Yep. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I would say, hey, you know, it's up to you. But uh, that, that's that's the part that I'm glad you mentioned that because somebody actually brought this up to me and they didn't have them here and I thought, well, you know, it's their choice. And yep, I'll answer. So, so did everyone hear that? Okay, I won't repeat it then. So, so uh, here's what I think: the, the Bible says, "Blessed is the man whose heart condemneth not, and that thing which he alloweth." What did it say? Okay, blessed is the man whose heart condemneth. Condemneth him not, and that thing which he allowed. Okay. So I mean, we we clearly know you shouldn't be drinking. We all agree there, but but different people might have different degrees of. You know, I'm not even going to hand the guy a beer. Well, well, okay. Or others might say, well, I'm going to hand him a beer, and I'm okay with that. I I like like for me, I guarantee you, I've n I'm never buying anybody a beer. Right. <laughs> you know, I'll buy a burger, uh, but so 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 you have that's part of that preparation. I'll be honest with you, though, as far as, you know, uh, as far as I don't drink very seldom, you know, but being honest with you, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't believe in getting drunk, you know, but as far as the drinking part, I, I'm kind of open to that, too, but I've seen a lot of damage done. Yeah. I used to work in a bar and stuff, and what drinking does, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, uh, so I'll, sum, I'll summarize it this way. I think we can all appreciate that each one of us is on our journey with God. And, and so you, you'll believe different, differently about different situations and matters as your Christianity unfolds. Different and levels. Different levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and again, I know in my own life, when I first got saved, I, I, really, I, I really leaned over on the excessive, I want to hold fast to truth. So I would tell people, listen, I don't drink. I, I be, because I was more, uh, maybe not as secure and so, I, and I was more focused on God that I didn't want to. I didn't want to sin against God. So, I, I, my feeling toward God was much stronger than what I thought about anybody else. I want to be right with my Savior. 
So I would just tell people, I don't do that anymore. Don't, but then as time went on, then I realized, what, 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 like what I've shared, if I tell guys, listen, I don't drink anymore, I realize that now, now that's something I might have to address because I brought it up. So I can be a little wiser and still not drink, but not bring up stumbling blocks in their way, you see. I, I've learned, for example, that I'm, I'm not going to bring up tithing and offering before they're saved. Again, another offering, it happened with a relative where he came to church and the pastor happened to preach on tithing and offering. And, and then we got, hey, well, what'd you think? Well, I'll tell you the truth, you talked about that 10%. I was doing math the rest of the service, you say. So, so, so just somebody, you know, because we, we were loving, but, but now it's something I got to deal with. And he thinks, if I got to be a Christian, I got to do this. I would rather, as quickly as possible, bring them to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And there, there's, there's going to be other things already in their way. I don't want to add, add to it. Uh, you know. but, but let's move on. But I, but I, I can see we got you thinking, and uh, but we're going to move on just to get through. Um, because that, that is this principle. And I don't have an answer for every situation. Uh, uh, how, how we can live among those we love and try to bring them to faith in Jesus and yet still maintain our Christian walk or our integrity, someone might say it. That's something that we have to navigate. And there's a, there's a lot more shades to it. Uh, I think of a verse, uh, uh, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the idea where I go into a tavern and I'm going to have a burger and fries. But the idea that depending on who I'm with, that might influence them in a negative way. Well, Jane goes to taverns here all the time. Then they don't know. So I'm, I'm careful about how I behave and how I might influence others and where they're at. I think that's a spiritual way to, to look at it. Did I see one more finger hand? Okay, yes, ma'am. Well said. Well said. Okay. All right. So, so let's let's continue. Uh, so then, her influence. Uh, there were people that were interested, had more questions, bring them to church, get some answers, uh, tag off on some other Christian. Hey, could you go visit him, Rick, or somebody else? Great, great. And that's what's going on in verse 41. So now they besieged, uh, they besought Jesus. They came and they they talked to Jesus themselves. That's the equivalent to coming to church and hearing the preaching, or, or they get a Bible. Now God is talking to them Himself from the Word of God or from the preaching of the Word. And guess what happens? It says in verse 41, and many more believed because of his own words. Now, hence, hence the idea, why did they believe? They, they believed because of what Jesus said. They believed be, uh, because of what the Bible says. So the idea that we can give our testimony, kind of what we hit on there, we can give our testimony, we can explain what God did in our lives, but the power of the word of God, use scripture, use scripture, memorize a couple of salvation uh, scriptures, memorize the Romans road. There is power in the word of God. Next one. And, and so then they testified, verse 42, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. How, how does a person hear God himself or herself now? Through the pages of the word of God. Okay. All right, so we got that. So any other questions? Let's move on. Uh, next section. So, so what you're going to do, how can you best influence others? You're, you can tell them what you believe. The idea there is your personal testimony. And we'll finish up at the end what that is, because i got a couple of bullet points on that. It's something that you should write. It's something that you should prepare. It's something that you should just about have memorized so that when, whenever it's required, boom, it just comes out. Your personal testimony. It's a, it's a tool in witnessing. It's a tool in sharing your faith. It's called your personal testimony. If you learn nothing else today, learn your personal testimony and go write it this week. All right, so, so secondly, you might have to challenge others to believe challenging others to believe. Let's watch how Jesus did it. It says in verse 43, 43 there, Mark, John chapter 4, verse 33. Now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Everybody understand that? Okay, that's basically saying, uh, like, your family, you might, you might not have honor in your own country. What's your own country? Not the United States, it is your country, but it's talking about your friends, maybe your family, because they know you, they know how you live, and, and it, might, it might be difficult for them to believe because they know how you used to be, okay? But then again, they might see the difference in you and, and the, the new creation that you've become, and that might be a powerful testimony. But Jesus was moving on because they said, well, isn't, isn't this Joseph's and Mary's boy? No, 
And so how can he be the son of God? Kind of thing. Okay, well, we know this Jaden guy. We know what he used to do, the tabernacle, all that. I, I don't know. They could be skeptical. And so you move on. You move on to others. All right, so verse 43. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went unto the feast. So, so that's the first category of people. As they, uh, the opportunity, we talked about this last week. We're going we're gonna to be considering, sharing our faith. We're going to try to follow the Spirit when we feel that little um, to, to maybe approach somebody. And, but some of them might not be open. Okay? All right. Move on to the next person. But some might receive. That might receive the truth. They want to, well, tell me more. They'll say it a hundred different ways, but you're, you're understanding because you're human and you have a spirit. You can understand, but they're willing. Well, you know, by ask, they'll ask questions, you know, or they'll just be able to receive truth. So then be prepared to give them more truth. About who? Jesus. Okay, got it. So, so, so many received because they had, they had seen him and what he had done in Jerusalem. I'm um, thinking it's a reference there into the temple and everything. They must have been there at the feast day. And, and, and they, they heard him speak. They saw him. And, and they believed. Great. The next group in verse 46. So Jesus came again on, unto Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judah into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. So a couple of things there. Uh, remember, now it's a nobleman, right? And uh, why is he seeking Jesus? Because his son's about to die. We understand that. <coughs> So the idea, and I put it in the bonus material, the reality of death is indeed a sufficient reason to challenge others to believe in Jesus. And, and hence, soul winners will say, hey, uh, do, you, do you know for sure when you die that you'll go to heaven? Do you know for sure where you're going to go when you die? Hey, did you ever stop and think about it? I mean, we're all going to die. Death and taxes. But a thousand years from now, you will have been dead for more than nine. Don't you think? So there's different ways that you can come up with phrases to get them thinking. And what's what's the idea? To think, think, make them think about that. I heard the preachers, well-known, famous preachers. I can't remember their name, but one of them said, "If I can get someone to think about death for five minutes, I can lead them to faith in Jesus Christ." And so we have an example here. Someone was willing to see Jesus because someone he loved or she loved, you know, was at the point of death. So you can use that in your witnessing. Questions. And you can think about different ways to present that. You know, hey, I love you. And you and I are not getting any younger. You know, you turn your head, and we were kids, and you turn your head, and all of a sudden, now I'm 56 years old. And the, the older I get, the faster life goes, you know. Or you can use, like, health insurance meetings and stuff like that. And people are, are preparing for, for, you know, the wills and the health insurance and life insurance and all that kind of stuff. And that's good to do. But, hey, have you ever thought about what happens after you die? And the will kicks in, and life insurance, and you provide. But what about your soul, Jack? You see, so you, so you just lovingly come up with your own words to, to bring up the topic and help them to prepare for death. Okay. Uh, next item that I had there was that, like this man here in uh, in verse 47, people turn to the Savior during life's darkest hour. So it can be death, but it can be any. Uh, how many times have you seen uh, God orchestrating the events of their life, and they they are on their back? The hospital, they're, they are really hurting, and we feel their pain. We see the difficulty, but, but if, if you're uh, spiritual and in tune, this might be an opportunity to bring up Jesus Christ. You could even use your testimony, because maybe you've gone through a similar situation. And, and you know, so I don't know what to tell you, but can I just share with you, I went through a similar situation. And you would not believe how my faith in Jesus, and I prayed to him like I'm talking to you, and, and through his word, and through the preaching, and I came to church next Sunday, and pastor, I swear that pastor must have followed me into that surgery room, because he preached the word, and it was like God himself was talking, and that did my heart, so God sustained me and helped me, let me tell you a little bit more about Jesus, can I? Okay. Stuff like that. Now here's what we're trying to do, that last phrase, remember Jesus said, he, he, he said, except he sees signs and wonders, he will not believe. We're trying to challenge them to believe. And here's the idea, that from time to time, people, maybe even you or others you know, they get to that point where if God will just do this for me, then they'll believe. 
Now, in this case, the guy was asking Jesus to heal his son. But it could be anything. God, heal my son. Or I've heard it put this way. I got to the point where I said, God, show me, show me that you're real. So, so, so you'll hear it ten different ways. But what they're asking is for some, for God to reveal himself by a circumstance. You with me? You understand? If, you, if you'll hear him, if you, God, if you heal my son. Huh? Yeah, you're telling God to prove it or show, show that he's there kind of thing. That, that, okay. We understand that. We probably have all, all been there. We probably all prayed that. Okay. But here's where we're trying to challenge them to move from a life that depends on all these continual miracles. You know, and then they do a miracle. Then you're on fire. You come to church for a month, and then you stop. And then three years later, another crisis. God, pray for a miracle. We here's where you're moving them to. You're moving them to believing God's words. That's where you want to take them. They're hurting. They're out of gas. You know, they can't pay the rent, all that kind of stuff. They're, if God will help me, that's foxhole religion. Lord, if you get me out of Vietnam, if you get me out of this foxhole alive, I promise. You see, that kind of, that kind of faith that's based on these continual God miracles, we're, we want to move them to, to, to faith. And what is faith? Faith is belief. Said. That's the Bible. You and I should be living that way. That whether God heals the puppy or not, that puppy could, could die. But I'm still going to follow you, Lord, because of what the Bible says. Your faith ought to be built on the Word of God. That's where you want to take them. Let's finish up. All right, on page 58. So you're going to guide others to believe. So it said guide others to believe, but I thought I better be, be specific. You're guiding others to believe in Jesus and who he is, but what does that look like? Believing what he said. So you're going to use scripture. All right, so let's finish up. Verse 49, and then, we'll, then we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be done. It said, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, he's addressing the Lord, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. You see it? You just Did Jesus have to come down? The guy, what, what God had said was good enough for him. All right, I'm heading back. And he believed what God said. That's the kind of faith that's going to save you and sustain you and help you live your life. So then off he went, already believing what God had said. That's where we want to move people. Verse 51, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth, glory to God. Of course, he wanted to find him all the time. <laughs> Isn't that great? All right, so verse 52, then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. This again this is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Ju Judah, Judea, into Galilee. So, so, so again, summarizing, you want to you wanna tell people what God did in your life. What's that called? Your testimony. It's your personal testimony. Or some will call it your testimony of salvation. Remember, it's, so, so let's finish up on the bottom of the sheet. Let's review. This is what you could do. You could do this week. In fact, it says it on page 59, faith and action. They, once in a while, they give you something to do. You could write up your personal testimony or your, your testimony of salvation. It's not your whole life story. The idea, and I have some points here. Uh, you, you can you, write it down. It should be about half a page. But, but, but write it. Write it down in your own words. If it's two pages, then you come and show it to me, show it to Pastor Jim, show it to anybody. But, but generally, you probably want to get it down to a page or less. Okay? It should be less than five minutes. Some would say one or two minutes. It should be short. It's not, well, I was raised here. And, then my, and, and here's why. You're going to use it to lead others to faith in Jesus. You don't, want to, you don't have forever. You might sit at the campfire. You might have all night. But generally, you don't. Okay? So you don't want to talk for 15, 20 minutes. It's all about you. They're going to get tired of that. You're going to say enough to tell them what, what Jesus did in your life so that you're going to, the Spirit of God's going to use that to prick some interest. You want them to be concerned about Jesus for their sake. You don't want to talk for 15 minutes and they go, well, well that was nice that that happened in your life. <laughs> see? See? That was good for you. Okay. No, no, you want to relate it to them. So, so it's going to be short. It's going to be, the, you're going to use easy to understand words because it's less confusing. Well, then I got saved. They don't know what saved means. 
Well, then, you know, then I had my born again. They don't know what born again means. Well, you know, but then when, when salvation and, 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 and Jesus, I understood that Jesus was the propitiation. <laughs> you just lost him. So, so put it in easy to understand words. That's why I write it down. Because if you're like me and you've been saved a while, you, you, it's going to be scattered with biblical words. And then you look back, a lost person, you know, they don't understand 10 of those words. You're going to lose them. And generally, here's the pattern. I have it under the third dot. Here's the pattern. It's going to be three parts. Here's how my life was before. And then here's the middle part. And it can be simply this. You can write it right in there. And then I had a life-changing experience. That's something they can understand. It's not a biblical word. But then I had a life-changing experience. And then the third part is how we all are after. So, so, so for me, I'll give you an example. Uh, for me, uh, Back in my 20s, I was finishing up school, college, I got a job. I was starting to accomplish all the things that I, I had set out in life to accomplish. And I had a good job working at IBM, big money, nice car, all that kind of stuff. And yet, there was something missing. I started to think, is this, is this all there is to life? And I was a guy that would look ahead, and I thought, I can see myself getting up, going to work, coming home, get, you know, going to the tavern every weekend. And I thought, is this all my life is going to consist of? So I was kind of searching. There must be more than just this. And then I met a Christian who told me about the Lord, and I, uh, for a lack of, I don't know how to say it, but I had a life-changing experience. And now I, I have a purpose in life. I know why I'm here. I, I have a relationship with God. And, and then best of all, I know for sure where I'm going when I die. Now, why would you say that? Because it's true, but that's maybe the phrase that that's going to lead you to, do you know where you're going to go when you die? No, I sure don't. Well, and they're likely going to say, what was your life-changing experience? Yeah. They're going to ask you questions. So that's the purpose. Use your personal testimony to plant curiosity, to get them curious about what Jesus did. And, and so they're going to ask questions, and then you lead them to faith in Jesus. Questions about that? Yeah, have that down there. To consider that. Again, your purpose is to use your testimony to not be all about you, but to, to guide people to faith in Jesus. Okay. So, you, so you're welcome to write one this week and bring it next week. I'll look at it with, with you. But, but that's literally what we've done here, and you memorize it so much that you can just kind of say it. Because you never know when you're going to run into someone. Okay. All right, we got to close in a word of prayer. Thank you for being here and for listening. All right. Thank you much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to look at the Word of God now in John chapter 4 here. Uh, plant some of that truth in us. Take away some of the fear in order to just give us an unction to go develop a personal testimony of, of how you saved us. That we would be equipped and have that ready. That we could be used of God, used of you, Lord, in the lives of others around us. I pray this by faith now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all for listening.